Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. So if you consume my content, especially like my evolution education content, then you are probably familiar with many other content creators on YouTube that focus on evolution. Um, and you probably have noticed that every single one of them have a series on evolution, right? And it's always kind of like a, uh, this is the glory of the world we live in and there's lots of little clips of animals running around and and like pretty shot pretty nature shots and things like that. And then they talk about, you know, Darwin's voyage and they talk about, you know, the the origin of species and natural selection and, and like they give you this sort of grand idea about evolution writ large and it's it's great, you know, it's it's entertaining and you know it's somewhat informative but one of the things that I noticed whenever I watch them as a practicing evolutionary biologist is that many times I find myself doing this kind of yeah, but thing, right? Where it's like, yeah, like in a simplistic way, that's true, but it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. And like, I always feel like these series sort of leave out the complexities. They, they leave out the nuance and for me, some of the most exciting things about evolutionary biology are the nuance and not only the nuance, but actually the kind of nuts and bolts, right? Like, like, like really getting down and dirty into the nuts and bolts of how evolutionary biology really works. And I think to a large extent, the reason that many of these more popular YouTubers don't do this is because it's you, you'll lose a lot of the audience, right? Like, like for many people that, you know, maybe have like only a high school biology education at best, digging in deeper might be a little bit daunting and might be a little overwhelming and almost certainly you'll get a lot less views. Well, see, that's where I come in because I am not like a big content creator. I do this entirely for fun. Um, and so to me, digging into the nuts and bolts, that's kind of what I do. That's what I really, really like. Um, and it's one of the things that I was kind of looking for on YouTube and wasn't really finding and thought, okay, you know, I'll start a channel and I'll do it, right? But I, I kept putting off the concept of like actually doing an evolution series, you know, because it just seemed, I don't know, it kind of seems pretentious, right? It's like, oh, that's been done. But over and over, you know, watching these th series, I thought, well, maybe there's a maybe there's a market, maybe someone will think, you know what, I've watched a lot of these things, but I kind of want to know more, right? I, I want to understand this at a, at a deeper, more fundamental level. If that's you, then this series is for you. And I'm calling it the causes of evolution. Um, I've pictured here this little cartoon. Um, this is JBS Haldane. Everybody should know who JBS Haldane is. He's one of the founders of the modern synthesis. Um, and as I said, this title was inspired originally from a 1931 lecture that Haldane gave um, that was titled a reexamination of Darwinism and shortly thereafter actually a year after he converted this series of lectures into a little book that I have here called called the causes of evolution. Um, it's not very long like the actual like content of it is only I think like 80 pages, um, but what makes this such a really cool book is he has this extensive appendix. Um, and in this appendix, he actually shows all of the mathematical derivations. So I like to kind of think about the first half of the book as sort of the, the YouTube equivalent of like the big broad series that popular YouTubers will do, right? You know, just sort of like glossing over the big picture things. And then the appendix being, let's really dig deep into the claims that I've made, right? I've said natural selection will do this. I've said, you know, Mendelian populations produce this kind of variation, right? I've said all of those things, but I'm not really showing you how we know those things. And that's what the appendix is in this little book. And interestingly, the appendix is almost as long as the book itself. Um, and so that that sort of layout kind of inspired me to do basically the same thing so that you can imagine this series as the appendix to the more popular and accessible series that you'll find on YouTube. So this is going to be a series in three parts. The first part, which is this part, is going to be focused on variation. Haldane himself dedicated two chapters of the causes of evolution to variation. Variation is an incredibly important topic that we must understand if we're going to understand 
how evolution works. The second part where we focused on the forces of evolution themselves. So instead of taking, again, sort of more bird's eye view of evolution, we're actually going to dig in to the statistical nature of populations. Um, and what I hope to demonstrate is that all of the things that we call evolutionary forces are actually just statistical properties of any population that behaves in a Mendelian fashion. And in that way, it's like, any population that has a binomial sampling system and binomial we mean in the next generation you're going to pass one of two possible choices in this case alleles to the next generation that sort of setup creates a sort of statistical environment upon which we can ask various questions on how that passing on to the next generation works what sort of sampling process is going on there and that that sampling process is the statistical nature of the forces of evolution. So we're going to dig into that. And that if that sounded like a mouthful, don't be afraid. We're going to dig in in great detail into that. Um, and then lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to take the two things, the variation and the forces, we're going to put them together and we're going to apply them to nature. We're going to look at what patterns have emerged given now that we understand variation and given that we understand the forces of evolution themselves. Um, so you can think of this as a sort of semi-advanced series of lectures on the yes, but aspects of evolutionary biology and and honestly i can't even take full credit of this yes but thing so i'm reading a book actually i have the leaf uh for it here the actual book is on my nightstand because i'm currently reading it but lawrence moran uh who ha actually is a, a molecular biologist i think at toronto and he runs a blog called sandwalk i'll have it in the link in the description below um wrote this excellent book called what's in your genome 90 percent of your genome is junk um and in this book he makes this this sort of argument right that a, a lot of the time when we're talking about genomics when we're talking about evolution there's a lot of moments in which you say yeah but x y or z so this series is the yes but of all of the more popular evolution series Okay, but to begin, we really need to give a very clear, concise definition of biological evolution. And if, if you're watching this video, you should already know this definition. Biological evolution is the change in the heritable characteristics of populations over successive generations. Right here in this definition, it tells us all the key things that we need to know about evolution. It tells us one that it is about change It is about how characteristics of populations change through time populations are not stagnant they are always changing that's biological evolution and specifically it's the change in the heritable characteristics um, and that aspect the heritable characteristics aspect will be the focus on this video while the change aspect will be the focus on the next video looking at the forces of evolution. When I think about evolutionary theory, the way that I really approach it is in a quantitative lens. What I think a lot of sort of the general public and maybe the, the average YouTube consumer, the way they might think about how we study evolution is we look at some things in the fossil record, for example. We see one organism that has this trait and then this other organism that has this trait and how did that trait change? Like what sort of scenario might have led to the evolution from this ancestral trait to this more derived trait? And in that way, evolution kind of becomes this, we're explaining patterns, right? right? We're just kind of taking our logic and we're explaining patterns that we see in nature. But in many respects, to me, this is the weaker part of evolutionary theory. It's the weaker part of evolutionary science. What makes evolution such a core part of biology is not its ability to explain patterns of the past, but in its ability to predict the future, to predict things we haven't yet seen. And at the heart of that, at the heart of that predictive nature is the quantitative aspects of evolutionary biology. Unlike basically all other fields of the life science, evolution is fundamentally a quantitative discipline. At its core is population genetics. And at the core of population genetics 
is statistics. In fact, all most of modern statistics derives from early evolutionary biologists like R.A. Fisher, Carl Pearson, these people, Udni Yule, right? These men were actually evolutionary biologists that were deriving statistical techniques to understand variation in populations, right? So that's that's sort of the heart and the history of evolutionary theory. And so what we want to be able to do, what a good scientific discipline should aim to do is to generate these sort of mathematical models, right, of, of increasing levels of complexity, generate these models, and then say, okay, given I know variables A, B, and C, I can plug them into this model, and I should get some answer, right, it should spit out some output. And the, the rigor of that model, how good that model is, is completely dependent on how well it can explain natural observations. So in this way, this mode of doing science is very risky. Right? You're taking something and you're just like going out into nature with it to see how well it works. Right. Well, as opposed to the other way that I call it the softer way where you're just you're all you've already made the observation and you're trying to explain post hoc in this way, you are taking your model, you are saying I should see X, Y and Z. Let's go see if I find it. Let's go see if the model can explain what I see. That is what evolutionary theory does at its very core. It predicts how populations are going to change through time, um, and and all of that, like the the bulk of that, started I think with with people like Sewell Wright. Um, of all of the characters in across you know the broad field of evolutionary theory, I think that Sewell Wright should be kind of considered as as the father of modern evolutionary genetics and like quantitative evolutionary theory. Um, you know, there were JBS Haldane was important, R.A. Fisher was important, um, there were many other figures that were very important, but I think Sewell Wright is at the heart of, of basically everything we understand in sort of the quantitative nature and the statistical nature of populations. Um, and Sewell Wright in 1931 published this incredibly important paper called Evolution in Mendelian Populations. And in it, he put forward this argument about how we should understand populations and understand evolution. He says, quote, the present status of genetics is that any theory of evolution must be based on the properties of Mendelian factors and beyond this must be concerned largely with the statistical situation in the species. Another way to think about this is the way Michael Lynch put it in his, in his excellent book called The Origins of Genome Architecture. Um, he says, quote, Nothing in evolution makes sense except in light of population genetics. You should recognize this as a restatement of Dubsansky's maxim, in which Dubsansky famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. Well, Lynch is taking that a step further and saying that we can't understand evolution if we don't understand population genetics. And again, that, quite frankly, most of these sort of popular evolution series, they don't get into population genetics, right? Population genetics is not the flashy thing that you think about when you think about evolutionary biology, but at its very core, the evolutionary theory at its core is a theory of population genetics. Um, and so I want to show you through this series, sort of the mathematical rigor behind evolutionary theory and to do that we have to understand that at its foundation at its very core is population genetics and so to kind of think about this how i'm going to pitch it in this series is that we're going to look at how we can study populations because there must be variation that's the beginning and then we're going to study what sort of forces shape that variation and that's where we're going to build models Right, we're going to build our models of nature by understanding the forces that are capable of shaping variation. And then when we start looking at patterns, we're going to go out in the nature, we're going to look into genomes and say, okay, these are the patterns that we see. Given that we know what sort of forces can shape those patterns, can we explain what we see? Can we make predictions about things we have not yet seen? And that's how I hope to tie this whole thing together and demonstrate for you the, the quantitative nature of evolutionary biology. So let's get started. Part one, the causes of evolution. What is variation? So if I were to just ask you, where does phenotypic variation come from? 
virtually all of you, especially again, if you've watched some of these um, evolution YouTube series, will say mutation. Mutation is the source of variation. So if you're gonna, if you can think about a, a sort of histogram here, that is, it's actually just normal distribution of with some trait value on the x-axis and then the frequency of that trait value on the y, you can see that there's continuous variation in this hypothetical trait, right? And we're asking, where does that variation come from? What is the cause of that variation? And again, most people would say mutation. And almost certainly genetics, the, the underlying heritable variation in populations contributes to this variation, right? So some individuals have one allele, other individuals have an alternative allele. And in this case, when there's this sort of continuous variation in a trait, it tends to be determined not by a single allele, but by many alleles. And we call this polygenic, that a single trait kind of interacts with many genes epistatically across the genome that then leads to some trait, right? Now, again, that's sort of the simplistic way of thinking about trait variation is that it emerges due to underlying genetic variation. But of course, that's not the only source of phenotypic variation. Another source is the environment itself, and in this I'm including not merely the sort of abiotic environment, like whether you live in the sort of mountainous area or whether you live in a desert, but also the biotic environment. So do you live in a forest, for example, which is a biotic environment because it's completely determined by trees? Uh, do you live in an environment that is that is very dense? There's lots of conspecifics or either even lots of heterospecifics all around you. Maybe you live in like a tropical rainforest where there are many, many species that you're constantly interacting with. All of these little components can also shape trait variation. To give a specific example, imagine a forest and you are like a pine tree. If you go to a pine forest, on the edge of it, you will see branches that will start at the base of the trunk and go all the way up the tree. The entire length of the tree, there will be branches sort of spreading out, soaking up that sunlight. But once you go into the forest, you will find that the trees no longer have branches lower down. All of the branches are very high in the canopy. Well, this is completely environmentally determined. Those, those two trees have the exact same genes for determining where branches are going to grow and how branches grow. The difference is that once you're in the center of the forest, you're no, you don't get sunlight at the base of the trunk. You're only getting sunlight in the canopy. So it's a waste of energy to produce branches farther down. Whereas on the edge of the forest, you're getting your entire trunk is being exposed to sunlight. And so it's beneficial to grow branches across the whole thing. So in this sense, the environment is shaping that trait. If I were to try to say that trees on the on the edge will always have branches that are low down and trees in the center will always have branches that are way up in the canopy, I would get the wrong answer, right? Because it's not genetically determined, it's environmentally determined. There is also a developmental component to this. During development, chance events happen that can alter traits and cause variation in populations. For example, there is some underlying genetics that determines fingerprint formation, right? That, that you, the reason you have fingerprints is there is some underlying genetic variation that, that, that creates it. And we also know that no two individuals have exactly the same fingerprints. You can say, oh, well, that's because of genetic differences between individuals. But did you know that your left and right hand have different fingerprints? Right? So if you, if you were to just compare even in your own body with the exact same genes, your opposing hands would have different fingerprints. How can that happen? Well, during development, despite the fact that, that every single cell in your body is being determined and formed by the exact same underlying code, little chance events happen along the way. Right? So, so think about development as just millions and millions of cell divisions. Right, millions and millions of like cells specializing in different ways to form different organ systems and tissue types, all of this thing, all of these things happening. And think about all the chance events that can happen along the way. All the genes that have to be transcribed, translated, the proteins that have to then migrate to the locations that they're actually gonna be used at. All of those things need to work perfectly for your fingerprints to be identical on both sides. And they never do. They never work perfectly. There's always little hiccups along the way. 
the vast majority of these hiccups are inconsequential. They don't hurt you. They don't help you. They're just little hiccups, little quirks, but they contribute to phenotypic variation in a population. Now, all of this may seem like, you know, an exceptionally modern way of viewing phenotypic variation. Like surely people a hundred years ago didn't know about this, but here's a paper from 1921 by Sewell Wright looking at fur patterns, color, coloration patterns in guinea pigs in which he is incorporating all of these different axes of variation. So the D's on the far left, that represents developmental variation. The E represents environmental variation. Between them, that C represents the chance combination of sperm and egg. So he's including the genetics, which are the sperm and egg combinations, the environmental effects, developmental effects, all of which lead downstream to differences in the offspring between their parents, i.e. contributing to variation in the population. All of these things interacting in this kind of complex network. So it's very important that we understand that underlying phenotypic variation is not merely the results of your genes, right? That there are other things that are interacting and that are shaping why you look the way you do and why people around the world look different, act different, etc. It's not just your genes. And in fact, in many of the phenotypes that, that make organisms different may not have a genetic basis at all. There may be no genetic reason why individuals are different from one another. It can be completely determined by the environment or by just developmental stochasticity. Now there's even more complication to this and that environmental traits can become correlated with genetic variants. And this is sort of a, a statistical mistake that many geneticists uh, commit even to this day, but that have made extensively throughout the past is trying to associate a genetic variant that they think is determining a phenotype that is actually just correlated with a genetic with a environmental variant. So let me give you an example here. So think about our trees again, right? So on the edge of the forest, the trees have low branches. Now, where are their seeds and pollen most likely to fall? On the edge of the forest. So if you looked across generations, you might would find, oh, it looks like having low branches is strongly correlated across generations. And it might just be that some mutation arises on the edge of the forest. And if you were to try to say, oh, here is a mutation and it's associated with having low branches, that's it. That's the causal variant, right? That mutation, low branches, that must be the cause of it. However, that completely ignores that it's confounded by the environment in which those individuals are growing. Now, again, Sewell Wright was one of the first people to notice this, and he studied this pattern in what he called population structure. And you can think about population structure as you are more related on average with individuals that you are near than you are with individuals farther away from you because of dispersal, because of limited dispersal. This is true even in humans. Despite being very dispersive, humans on average stay, live, grow up, and find mates in the town they were born in, right? They, they very rarely disperse very far, right? Some of us, you know, disperse across the globe, but that's pretty rare. Most humans don't do that. And so what happens is that if you were to look at relatedness in a town, right? Those, everyone in that town are going to be more related on average than if you were to pick one individual from that town and then one individual from some distant area. This is what we call population structure. Um, and because of that, you can get these correlations between the environment, because wherever you happen to be living at, that's an environment, right? And so if there's any variation that emerges among those individuals that are unique to that area and not to other areas, they're all going to have it at a higher frequency than other areas. And so if you just naively tried to associate genetic variation with some trait right, but that trait is actually environmentally determined, then you would be confounding the environment with genetics. And again, this is a very, very important concept in understanding 
genetic variation and just understanding phenotypic variation and what evolution is actually going to be acting up. So while this might seem just like purely academic, it has pretty big consequences. So this is a paper um, that was the result of an entire saga of studies that were looking for signatures of adaptation um, in human height in Europe. So as many of you probably know, there's this pattern in that lower in that Southern European countries are individuals are on average shorter than they are at higher European countries or, or higher latitude European countries. So there's this kind of, kind of kind of positive relationship between latitude and human height in Europe. For the longest time, it was thought that that was because of natural selection, that there was something beneficial to being taller in higher latitudes. Maybe it's you conserve energy better if you're taller in higher latitudes. I guarantee you somebody, if not most of you watching this, have heard that story, right? And, and think that that's, that that's actually the way that it works. But what, has, but what this study found is that many of the genetic variants that they thought were associated with human height are actually confounded by population structure. And so all of that, un, all of that signature of selection is completely explained by the fact that humans in Southern Europe mate with individuals in Southern Europe. Individuals in Northern Europe mate with individuals in Northern Europe. And so the different variants that arise in those populations increase in frequency in those populations. Now, it could very well be that being tall is beneficial across the whole of Europe. It could be, it could be that being tall is beneficial in all humans, completely irrespective of their environment, but you wouldn't be able to tell it because those variants for being tall haven't managed to progress across the rest of the environment. Right. So there's this again, there's this confounding effect of limited dispersal and environmental correlation with genetic variation. Now, all of that might seem unnecessary. Like, why do we need to know this to understand evolution? And it's because at the very core, there is exist in many of these sort of popular science, popular evolution series, this idea that evolution explains everything, right? That all variation among humans, among any animal for that matter, is explained by evolution. And that can lead to some really problematic thinking. And I'm sharing this tweet by someone who had this exact idea. Um, they're talking about evolutionary psychology, basically the idea that all behavioral differences, all psychological differences between humans are explained or can be explained using principles of evolution, like natural selection, right? And so they state, my point is that nothing other than evolution explains our psychology. I hope in just the past, I don't know, 10 minutes or so that I've been talking, you have other ways of explaining differences in psychology than evolution. And again, because evolution is only acting, if we go back to our original definition, evolution is about the change in heritable characteristics. Heritable. You don't inherit environments. You don't inherit development. Now, those things can be correlated with things that you are inheriting, right? But you don't physically inherit those things. So, for example, let's say the environment allowed or, let, or let's say some quirk in development right allowed you to leave more offspring than the average number of individuals in the population if we measured your fitness you have high fitness but your evolutionary fitness that is to say your ability to contribute lineages to successive generations not just the next one but successive generations is no different than average Right, because what permitted you to have higher fitness was not genetics. It wasn't the heritable characteristics uh, that, that you possessed. It was a developmental quirk. So while you may have more offspring, your offspring won't have more offspring, right? 
We actually call this regression to the mean. It's, it's an old statistical idea that, again, an early evolutionary biologist and actually the cousin of Darwin, Francis Galton, first discovered. This idea that individuals that have, in, in our case, higher number of offsprings than average, so let's say they fall outside of the mean, in the next step, in the, in the next iteration, whatever values that they had, so let's say they had five offspring where the average number is two, right? Their children will regress back and only have two offspring. That's what we mean by regression to the mean, okay? So in that case, in the developmental case, in the environmental case, these things can become correlated with genetic variants, but they are not causal. They are causal of phenotypic variation, but they don't contribute an evolutionary response. So Charlotte Russell is very wrong because they don't understand the nature of variation. And again, this is something that you don't see many popular YouTubers talk about. If we are going to understand evolution and what can evolve, we have to understand the nature of phenotypic variation. Otherwise, we will fall into the trap of thinking that evolution explains every difference. And that's just not true. Okay, so is it just hopeless? Like, what, what do we do now? Can, can, we, can we actually disentangle these effects? Absolutely. This is what the field of quantitative genetics does. Um, is we, we take into account that all of these different things are contributing to that variation in fitness, and then we show how we can actually disentangle them. So for our purposes, let's think about the effects of genes and the environment and development. Let's think about all of those things as additive. So P sub I represents the phenotype of individual I is equal to the mean phenotype in the population plus G sub I, which is the variance that is introduced from their, from their genes, from individual I's genes, plus the variance that is introduced from the environment, right? And so those two things are interacting with the population mean to shape the phenotype of that individual. Furthermore, the population has a mean, P bar, that has a variance, and the variance of that mean is equal to the variance from genes, which is sigma squared G, plus the variance that is induced by the environment. And in this, we're also including developmental effects. We're just going to sum them all into one little category that we're calling the environment. And so what is evolution fundamentally interested in? What can evolve is the genetic variance right? It's not the environmental variance. The environmental variance doesn't evolve. What the environment does is its own thing. Now, this is not to say that animals don't influence the environment. They absolutely do. It's a, it's a feedback loop in which animals are changing the environment. The environment is interacting with animals and this really complex network. But that environmental change can in many respects be completely decoupled from what animals are doing. An asteroid coming and hitting the earth completely decouples an animal's ability to change its environment, right? It's just getting smashed by an asteroid. And that's just an environmental effect that animals have to respond to. And so fundamentally, when we're thinking about evolution, we're concerned with the change in the genetic variance. And this concept is captured in the idea of heritability. How heritable is a given trait? And so we define heritability, and in this sense, the broad heritability, as the variance in genetics divided by the variance in the total phenotype, right? And the, that total phenotype, as we know, being the sum of the variance from genetics and the variance from the environment. And fundamentally, that heritability measure is what we're interested in. So how much a trait is going to respond to any of the forces of evolution that we'll talk about next time is determined by how heritable that trait is. So a trait can be 100% heritable. That is to say any variance around that trait is completely determined by genes. There is no other effect. Nothing in the environment can change what that variation is going to look like. Um, but a trait could be, for example, 80% heritable, or it could be 5% heritable or 2% heritable, right? There's a whole range of possible heritability, and that heritability measure tells you something about how well it will respond to evolutionary forces. And so, okay, so now that we have that sort of uh, theoretical background, let's think about how we can disentangle the environment from the genetic 
variation. So simplistically, let's think about it like this. Let's start at the top panel. We have some mean, and what we want to do is we want to select, let's think we're like a breeder or something. We want to select from our, our hypothetical population only individuals that have trait values two or higher. Right, and remembering that the current mean is zero. So nobody less than two breeds, only individuals two and higher. All right, that's what we've done. We al allow those individuals to breed. What does the mean look like in the next generation? Well, if the mean in the next generation goes from zero to one, right, then notice that we've been able to increase that the mean of that trait, right? We've increased it one step from zero to one, but notice that it's still only half of what we actually selected for. We selected for two and above, but we only got one. So what happened? Why, why didn't the entire population shift to two? Everybody that was below two didn't get to breed. So where is the rest of that variation coming from? Well, to understand this, let's introduce some more terms. So first is the selection differential. This is the difference between the selected group and the population mean. So remember, we only selected individuals from two and above. And so that difference is two and above minus the original mean of the population. Next is the response to selection. And this response to selection is the difference between the mean phenotype of the progeny and the previous generation mean phenotype. And we call these respectively S for selection differential and R for the response to selection. From that, we can actually get what we expect the response to be as equal to R equals H squared, which is our heritability estimate, multiplied by the selection differential. Notice that the heritability estimate, again, is, is just the variance in the genetics divided by the variance in the phenotype. Now, notice here we're using little h instead of the big h that we used before. The little h, whenever you see that value, what that actually represents is what we call the narrow sense heritability. So broad sense heritability includes genetic variation that can be from any kind of variation. So it can be additive, it can be dominant, it can be epistatic, any way in which genetic variation might be contributing that's the broad sense. But it's very difficult to disentangle dominance effects, epistatic effects, and additive effects. Additive is the easiest to disentangle, and that's usually what like most agricultural like farmers are interested in, is the additive genetic variant. So that's the variance where the, their, the trait is determined by the sum of the effects of each individual allele. Like you can literally say this allele adds this much, this allele adds this much, and you can just sum them up and that's the trait value you expect to see. That's the additive genetic variance. So as you might imagine, it's a very easy you know, value to measure, right? So in the narrow sense heritability, that's what we're focused on. So that's the sigma squared sub A just represents that additive genetic variance. Now, since we know that R is equal to one, the response to selection, right? We went from a mean of zero to a mean of one. And the selection differential is two because we went from, we wanted to go from zero to two. And so what we can do then is just rearrange the equation, plugging in the values that we got, and we see that the heritability of this particular trait is 50%. So again, what does this 50% mean? It means that 50% of the variance in this trait is due to genetic effects, whereas the other 50% is due to environmental effects. So another way to think about this is that the variance in that trait that can evolve, that can be under some force of evolution, is 50% of it. The other 50% is going to be shaped by the environment. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked about where phenotypic variation comes from, and we know that what we're really interested in, as we said in the beginning, is the heritable component of that variation, let's now switch gears and just focus from here on out on the genetic variation. Now, again, I wanted to give you that, that preamble because I think it's super important for us to understand where variation comes from and to understand that a large part of the variation of any population is not subject to selection. It's not subject to for the forces of evolution. It's subjected to the stochastic nature of the environment or the stochastic nature of development. So when you go out and you try to understand why are people different from each other? Are you, are it, you can think about it like maybe a little bit less maliciously as why are animals different from one another, why are trees different from one another, but 
and in many respects, I do this because a lot of the times people take sort of simple Mendelian principles and they try to apply them to differences in humans, differences in culture, differences in behavior. Please, please, if you get nothing else from this video, understand that at the core, genes explain only a fraction of the variation that exists in human populations. A great deal, and if not, to some extent, the majority can be explained by the environment or by differences in just development. So please bear that in mind as we move forward. Okay, so with that groundwork laid, let's think about how genetic variation is partitioned across your genome. If you are a computer programmer, and you have any skills in Python, I'm going to include the code for all the figures that I've made in the next couple of slides, um, because these are actually simulations that you can do yourself. Um, and so if you have uh, access to Python, I did this in Jupyter Notebook, because I think it's like a little bit prettier to show. Um, I just include the code here in case you want to run it and try to generate your own figure that looks like this. So how is genetic variation partitioned across the genome? Um, most living things are prokaryotes. I know we're kind of eukaryote biased, but the majority of living organisms on this planet are actually prokaryotic and they're haploids. So they have one genome and there's no recombination in prokaryotes. Now, there is horizontal gene transfer, which is very similar to recombination, um, but it's not strictly recombination in the way that eukaryotes do it. Um, but in general, just simplistically thinking, the that haploid genome, any variant that arises on it is inherited every single generation in its totality. Now that is not true in diploid eukaryotes because of a process called recombination. And recombination happens whenever homologous chromosomes are pairing up during meiosis and they have they undergo what's called crossing over where portions of the chromosomes will actually swap with each other. And so what this does is this makes a very, very interesting pattern emerge across the genome. Now, remember, since that's your heritable material, right, the genome is what you're inheriting from generation to generation, that's swapping over. So let's say, for example, you got one from mom, one from dad. So those are initially distinct from each other. But what you give to the next generation is one of these two. However, they could during meiosis recombine. So you give 90% of your mother and 10% of your father to the next generation. Now, if we were to ask in the next generation of your offspring, we're gonna go across their genome and say, okay, what, where's the common ancestor? Where did this genome come from? 90% of it, we would say, oh, that comes from the grandmother, right? 90% of it clearly comes from grandmother. And then suddenly we hit a point where it, where the pedigree goes the other way. Now the pedigree comes from grandfather, right? And so if we take that genome and then we sample some random other person from the population that's unrelated, just some random other person, and we compare their genomes and say, okay, how far back do these two genomes share a common ancestor? Well, because of recombination, notice they're gonna share common ancestors at different parts or at different times. Because again, 90% was from grandmother whose common ancestor with this random person may be you know, 10 generations back. Whereas grandfather, that common ancestor with this other individual may be 50 generations back, right? And so what that, what that leads to is different tree topologies, different pedigrees across your genome because of recombination. And that's what this figure here is showing. So along the x-axis is genomic position from zero to 5,000. And then every little break, every little tree represents a recombination point. Okay, so from the first one is from zero to 141. And that block, we call that a linkage block, all of the, the individual nucleotides from zero to 141 are inherited as a unit. And that represents one topology. And in this case, we've got you know, six individuals, and those are the relationships among those six individuals. For example, individual zero and two have a common ancestor that's individual six, and that individual shares an ancestor with individual four and individual nine, and then that little cluster shares an ancestor with one and five at ten, etc. Now notice the last linkage group is actually pretty interesting because it has an individual that is not present in the three other trees. If we look here, we have individual seven, 
as the common ancestor of zero and one, whereas in these other trees, zero and two are one another's most recent common ancestor. So in this case, zero and one now are more related to one another for this part of the genome than they are in any other part of the genome, where they are more related to in zero, for example, is more related to individual two than they are to individual one, whereas in this part, individual zero is more related to individual one than they are to individual two. Now, I know this is a little bit complicated, um, but because of recombination, gene trees across the genome are not uniform. Right. And this is where the idea of like incomplete lineage sorting comes from this very pattern. Right. It comes from the fact of recombination in diploid organisms and all organisms that undergo recombination. You will see that across the genome, you have different ancestors that lived at different times just just because of the underlying pedigree due to the shuffling of alleles. And so I want to show you on a full pedigree what this kind of looks like. So up here on the left is what we call the full ancestral recombination graph. And this represents the full relationship of all sampled individuals across the pedigree and across the genome. So it has kind of three axes. It has a genomic axis, right? That's actually the position in the genome because recombination happens on the physical genome. It has the time axis that's backwards in time to some ancestor, and then it has this sort of topological axis that's where those relationships are in terms of when do you coalesce versus when do you recombine. Um, and sort of a rule of thumb in looking at these graphs is that uh, coalescence brings lineages together into the past, right? They merge into the past, whereas recombination splits them into the past. And I'm going to show you how that happens. So, down here on the bottom, we'll start on panel A, just try not to get lost in these other three, just look at this one. We have these two individuals. Two individuals are, are modern day samples. Now, because individuals are diploid, they have two genomes. So this sampled individual has genome one in green and genome two in yellow. This individual has genome three in blue and genome four in red. Now let's trace back the the ancestry across this so the yellow one finds their first ancestor here here and then we have a coalescent event in individual six right here between genome two and genome one yes i know these individuals are highly <laughs> inbred but just this is just for simplicity so what that generates this little pattern here where one finds an ancestor in six two finds an ancestor in six is this tree Right, so one and two have an ancestor in six. That's what that that's what that tree would look like. Very simple, very straightforward. We can follow it, no problem. What about individuals three and four? And by I mean, what about genomes three and four? Well, notice what happens in 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 the ancestor of individual four. There's a recombination event right here, and what that has done is that's taken the original complete red genome and broken it in half so that one comes is going to be on a different genetic background than the other one so if we trace this portion right because now it's broken up remember it's splitting it backwards in time we trace this portion it finds an ancestor an individual five right so three and four for this part find an ancestor in five but what about this part where do three and four find that ancestor well, notice that they don't find an ancestor until all the way back here in individual eight. But to get there, notice that we have a second recombination event right here, right? So not only do we split it up here, we split again here. And so there's actually three topologies that emerge because of this recombination. So individual three, can find an ancestor with this genome either in five, in eight, or in nine, depending on where you look. And if you look at this gray bar, this represents in the across the genome where those recombination events are actually taking place. So the, they're taking place, the first one is right here. So that means for this block, individual three and four find an ancestor in five. For this block, here, individuals three and four don't find an ancestor 
until eight. And then for this last block, they don't find an ancestor until individual nine. So across the genome, they have a different ancestor backwards in time. Now we can represent this in several different ways. We can represent it as a graph like this here, where you show, you know, first, this is the simple one, but then here's three and four, here's that first ancestor in five, and then you have recombination that again, like I said, splits it. So it splits it where the ancestor is in an eight and in nine, that's the full graph. I find this the harder way of interpreting um, the tree. What's a little bit easier for me is actually thinking about the full ancestral combination graph as a series of local trees. So we can represent this as a series of local trees where this block is this tree, right? And this is kind of how I explained it just a moment ago, right? That's this tree here where three and four find an ancestor in five. Remember, this is the full thing. We can see where that is, right? Through there. The second block here, where three finds an ancestor with one and two before they do with four here in seven, right? So we can follow that. So one and two come back to six, and then they meet with three at seven, right? We can trace it right through there to seven, but four hasn't joined us yet. Four doesn't join until eight. That's what this tree is showing. And then the second one, or the, la the third one here, is this last little block where one, two, and three are all uh, related at individual seven, and then they don't find an ancestor with individual four until all the way back to individual nine. Okay, I know that was a lot of information and maybe um, a little bit of a brain overload. So let's just take a step back and let's think about why this is important for us to understand. So remember, what we want to eventually do with all of this information is we want to be able to make predictions, right? We want to go out into nature, we want to take our quantitative understanding of evolution and make predictions about what we should see in nature. Well, to be able to do that, we need to understand how variation emerges and what sort of patterns we can see in the heritable characteristics. So recognizing that heritable characteristics and populations have this sort of structure, where there's lots of local trees with different ancestors helps us kind of start thinking about how we might could build a model to understand evolution, right, by understanding it in the sort of tree like fashion. But the next thing that's really important is to understand how mutations occur in individuals and how they relate individuals across the population or within our little sample. The way we can unthink about mutations is in along this ancestral recombination graph, because yes, they happen at genomic locations, but the patterns in which they are shared across the population depends on where they are occurring along that time axis and along that axis of topology, right? So if we look first in this little block from zero to 141, we have one mutation and it's occurred right here. So there it is on its genomic position, but which of our samples has it? Well, that depends on where that mutation occurred, both in time and in topology. Well, we can see that it occurred right here, leading to individual three. What that means is only individual three has this mutation here. Now notice that that tells us something about how individual three is related to everyone else, because only three has it, whereas none of the rest of the samples have it. And look at the way in which that mutation tells us something about the relatedness of this part of the genome. So just, just kind of keep that in the back of your head as we're going through this. Next, we see we've got a series of mutations. We go one, two, three, four mutations that occur along this haplotype. And then we can see, look along that time and topology axis, we can see that one of them occurs on the lineage heading to three. So there's a second variant that three has that nobody else has. And then we have two variants that are occurring along this branch. So this is very interesting. What does this tell us? This tells us that all of these individuals, one through five, or zero, two, four, one, and five, have these two mutations. They all have them right? Because they occurred along the branch leading to them. So that, so it, this, these two mutations are at relatively high frequency for our sample because everyone has it except for three. Whereas the mutations we've seen leading to three are at very low frequency because only three has it with respect to the rest of the sample. 
Next, we also can see that we've got mutations here leading to individual, uh, leading just before one and five. So there's a mutation that one and five has. And then it looks like we've got one more mutation here that only individual five has. And then we see the same pattern across the genome. So again, just kind of reinforcing this idea that mutations are occurring not just across the genome, but that the way in which we understand how they relate individuals in the population is by considering the other two axes, the time axis as well as the topological axis. Um, and I've shown here another way in which you can represent this. So you've got the sites in which they have occurred. So this is from site zero um, across all polymorphic sites. So you've got 13 polymorphic sites from 0 to 12. Um, and then we have what the ancestral state was, because this is a simulation, so we know what the ancestral state was, the ancestral state here, and then what each individual has them, right? So then we can go down and we can see, okay, all the individuals have Cs except for three. That's that mutation there, right? That's site 0, that mutation. The next one is site 1, which I said was this one here. Now, remember, this is the one that I said um, is at higher frequency. So notice the ancestral state is T, but everybody here has a G except for individual three, right? And that's because of where that mutation occurred um, with respect to the topology and time. Um, and so you can look at that, you can look at all of the different uh, allelic variation across the genome and how it relates individuals. Okay, so just kind of broadly speaking, what kind of variation can this be? We haven't been very specific here. Um, this kind of variation doesn't just have to be an A to a T or a C to a G. It doesn't have to be a single point mutation. This could be an insertion. It could be a deletion. It could be an indel, which is just what we call insertion or deletion, where we don't know which one it is. Um, because you don't generally know what the ancestral state was, uh, you would just say, okay, it, it's either an insertion or it's a deletion, right? So we just call it an indel. Um, they could be broader mutations as well. So they could be like whole scale deletions, whole scale insertions, duplications, inversions, all of the different kinds of mutations that are possible to occur happen in exactly the same. They generate the same pattern across the genome because they are occurring along that pedigree, right? Along that ancestral recombination graph is where these mutations are actually occurring. Okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about is how we actually measure genetic variation. So now we've looked at how variation occurs, what, you know, what dictates variation, and we've looked at how it's partitioned across the genome. So let's actually think about how we could measure genetic variation in a quantitative way. Um, so this is a data set. This is an actual data set from the RH3 gene, which is a rhodopsin gene. Um, rhodopsin is well, it's one of the proteins that forms the cones in the eyes of Drosophila. Um, so this is one gene that has five different alleles. So that's shown on this axis here. So it's F through J. Um, the entire region, the entire gene is 500 base pairs long, and there's 16 polymorphic sites in those 500 base pairs, right? So 484 of those base pairs are not polymorphic. They're monomorphic. So they're fixed. They're exactly the same among all individuals, but 16 of them are different between individuals, right? Um, so let's see, can we get some measure of how variable is this population? How variable are these alleles in this organism? So the way that we need to think about this um, is via pairwise comparisons, right? So what we need to do is for each one of these sites, for every possible allele, so the columns and the rows, and think about how many unique ways can we combine them, right? And then we need to count up all of the different all of the differences between each one of those unique combinations right so we can think about this kind of simplistically as the number of differences first between allele f and allele g plus the number of differences between f and h all the way to the number of differences eventually between i and j right and this actually creates this triangle of pairwise comparisons where we're just not considering the diagonal so only the off diagonal elements um, and then you sum all of that up, and that's how many possible uh, pairwise comparisons that you're going to be making. A simple way of thinking about that is you can just think about it as n, which is the number of alleles you have, multiplied by n minus 1, divided by 2, tells you how many comparisons you're going to be making. So instead of actually like going through and counting all of those, you can just use that simple formula 
And in that case, we have five alleles, so five is in. So five times five minus one divided by two is 10. All right, so there are 10 possible pairwise comparisons that we could be making for this data set. So if we just focus on site one, notice how there are two Ts and there are three Cs. Uh, uh, allele F and G are both T, and then alleles H, I, and J are all C. So that's two times three equals six total differences for that specific site. So one of the most common forms of measurement is nucleotide diversity, and this is normally symbolized by pi. So nucleotide diversity is the sum of all the pairwise differences divided by the number of possible pairwise comparisons that we can make in the first place. So since on site one, we had six differences, in site two, we have six differences, in site three, we have four differences, and we just do this all across the data set. So we have six instances where we have a six, so one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's six times six plus four times nine, because we have one, two, three, four, five, we have nine fours, and then we only have one seven, this one here. So that's the sum of all the pairwise differences. Um, so down here, what we've done is we've taken the number of differences, so that's the polymorphic sites, multiplied by the number of pairwise comparisons, plus the number of monomorphic sites, so the sites that aren't different, times the number of pairwise comparisons. That's 16 times 10, because remember there are 16 polymorphic sites, and then 484 times 10, because there are 484 monomorphic sites. So we put all that together, and we get a nucleotide diversity of 0.0158. So on average, 2% of the sites you look at will be different. So the last thing that I want to talk about is a very, very important source of understanding genetic variation, and that's by looking at what we call the site frequency spectrum. Now, the way that this is graphed is along the x-axis are categories um, going from singletons, doubletons, tripletons, etc. And what these means are how many individuals possess this allele, right? So is this allele only present in one individual in your sample? Then it's a singleton. Is it present in two individuals? Then it's a doubleton, et cetera. Um, and again, just keep that ancestral recombination graph in the back of your head to think about how this variation emerges, right? So remember three was the one that had a lot of like just single mutations that nobody else had. So those are singletons. They would be in this first bar. And then, you know, as far up in frequency as you can go up to the number of samples that you have. And then the y-axis represents just the count of how many of those alleles you see. So like you find in this case, 40,000 singletons, right? So that's a lot of, in, lot of variation that only one individual has, okay? Whereas you have only 20,000 doubletons. So half that many are alleles that are shared by at least one other individual, et cetera. Now notice that this tells us something very important about the maintenance of genetic variation. So in this case, the vast majority of the variation is in singletons, right? So only one individual has it, whereas you have progress on exponentially less individuals that have shared many shared variants, right? Um, what this tells us is that most new mutations, so in that category of singletons, you can think about these as new mutations, are lost to drift within a few generations and the first generation or within a few generations that that's what what this shape is telling us that the vast majority of new mutations that are only harbored by one individual don't get passed on right they don't actually reach high frequency that's another way to think about this is that the further and further across this x-axis you go the higher frequency that those alleles are appearing in your sample set Right, so you have very few alleles that are at very high frequency and you have a ton of alleles that are at very low frequency. Now the shape of this curve is very informative about demography. So in stable equilibrium populations that aren't changing in size, there's no selection, it's just kind of a stable, neutrally evolving population, you have a site frequency spectrum that looks like this, with a large number of singletons and then the sort of exponential decay in the frequencies of higher and higher, higher frequency alleles, right? That's what a stable equilibrium population looks like. So keep this shape in mind because we're gonna use things like 
the genetic variation we talked about, the ancestral recombination graphs, and the shape of the allele frequency spectrum to begin to construct the models that we're going to use later on to understand and make predictions about how populations have changed. So one of the things you might be curious about is how can it be that we can use genetics to predict population size change? How do we know the populations were bigger or smaller in the past? How do we know those sorts of things? Well, we need to understand this base knowledge, right, that this is what a stable equilibrium population looks like, and that we're going to apply this knowledge later on when we start constructing more complicated models to understand how we can actually make predictions about how populations have changed through time. So again, like I said, this is kind of laying that that groundwork and the site frequency spectrum is sort of central to a lot of demographic models that are interested in population changes through time. So keep this keep the shape of this in mind. It's definitely going to come back. So I know that was a lot of information. It was a lot of me rambling. I don't have a script. I'm just kind of doing this on the fly because I feel like it's a little bit more organic. Um, but hopefully you, you, you've taken something away from this. Um, the first is that there are distinct causes of variation and only the heritable variation can cause biological evolution. Now, that's not to say these other factors don't influence phenotypes. They, they absolutely influence phenotypes, but fundamentally to have an evolutionary response, right? For a population to evolve, that variation needs to have a genetic basis to it. If the variation is solely dictated by development or environment, there can be no evolution. Now, again, you can have you know, stochastic changes in that in, in that phenotypic trait because the environment changes stochastically, right? But it's not evolution. Um, and again, I, I tried to pitch this in a way that helps you understand and helps you kind of think about maybe some implicit bias that you might have when you start thinking about why certain behaviors exist or certain traits exist. So why do some cultures do this and other cultures do that, right? Why do some humans act like this and other humans act like that? Why do we look different? I, I, I really want you to think about the causes of underlying phenotypic variation or the underlying causes of phenotypic variation when you approach those kinds of problems and that hopefully you don't just approach them with a purely sort of genetic determinism um, and understand that there are complex multifactorial things that are interacting with each other that then give rise to phenotypic variation, some of which may be genetic, some of which may not be genetic. Um, second is that variation exists along the branches of a population pedigree, which is constantly shifted during recombination. Right, so all across your genome for any sample for any subsample of a population across the genome studied they will have different relationships among individuals among each individual in your sample set right at some parts of the genome two individuals in your sample will be one another's closest relative in other parts of their genome they will be one another's most distant relative right that's what recombination fundamentally does to pedigrees. And that tells us a lot about how genetic variation is maintained and shaped in populations and how we can use that underlying genetic variation to understand how those pedigrees are constructed. So kind of going, working backwards to reconstruct those pedigrees that the mutations are occurring on, right? So that's the second component that we talked about. Um, and then lastly, that variation is measured and visualized in a range of different ways, including counting pairwise differences, what we call nucleotide diversity or pi, um, and by utilizing the site frequency spectrum. Um, and then we teased a little bit about how things like nucleotide diversity, patterns of nucleotide diversity, as well as the site frequency spectrum can help us understand um, and make predictions about evolution in natural populations. So hopefully you found this informative. I know this was a ton of information. Please feel free to drop a comment, ask questions. I'd be more than happy to discuss this further. Um, and thanks so much for being here. And I hope you stick around. Um, the next two videos will be very much like this, kind of free flowing, kind of me just like off the cuff talking. Um, so, you know, a lot less scripted, just, just kind of, you know, in a, in a more lecture style discussion format, as I think that that's a little bit more conducive to understanding these, these more complex topics. So, you know, again, let me know if you had any questions in the comment, hit that like and subscribe, and I will catch you all next time.